What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about pericardial diseases. Again, this is gonna be a part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys like this video, you benefit from it, it helps you, please support us, and you can do that by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, if you guys really do wanna benefit more, I really suggest you guys check out the link in the description box below. It takes you to our website. We have notes, illustrations, we're developing courses for those taking the step one, step two, the pants, et cetera. Check that out. Also, we got a lot of merchandise that you guys can check out and get some swagoo going on. Let's start talking a little bit about pericardial diseases, though. So pericardial diseases, there's a couple of them, right? The biggest ones are gonna be acute pericarditis, constrictive pericarditis. There's also gonna be this intermediate that we'll discuss a little bit about called the pericardial effusion. And then the MAC daddy, the one that scares you and makes you pee out your butthole, cardiac tamponade. This is the fearful one. So what happens in these processes? What's the pathophysiological process? What's the causes? How do we differentiate them? So here we have a heart, right? And we have this normal pericardium, which is in pink. This is usually a double layer. If we go back to our anatomy, right? You have the visceral layer, and then you have the parietal layer. And then you have the pericardial cavity, which is filled with serous fluid in between. When a patient develops acute pericarditis, they develop inflammation of their pericardium. That's the underlying process, right? So there's some type of inflammation that is actually occurring here that's causing the pericardium to become angry. And we'll talk about what those causes are in just a second, but there's definitely inflammation which is going to be stimulating or triggering the formation of acute pericarditis. Now let's just say here that I got an angry pericardium, right? So this pericardium is super, super angry. You wanna think now, what will cause this guy to become super angry? And oftentimes, generally it's idiopathic, and what that means is we don't really know why it occurs. But the ones that we kind of generally assume is that it's oftentimes what's triggering this is usually infectious. And what do I mean by that? So infectious, there is two different types of infections that I want you guys to think about. One is viral. And oftentimes this is Coxsackie B virus, all right? So that's one. And then sometimes in certain patients who are immunocompromised or in there where it's very high populations, where endemic populations, tuberculosis can be another infection that can really plague the pericardium. The other one is post-MI. If you guys remember, if a patient has an end STEMI or a STEMI, we said that that can create a local inflammation and agitate the pericardium. And if it's like one to three days, it's called fibrinous pericarditis. And if it's 14 days or more after they had an MI, that's Dressler syndrome. Another one, a really, really big one, is uremia. So uremia is a really, really big one. This is when a patient has usually some type of underlying chronic kidney disease or a terrible AKI. So look for this in a patient who has like CKD or an acute kidney injury. And what happens is their BUN and their creatinine are really, really high. And that can cause uremic pericarditis, one of the complications. All right, so look for a patient who's had any features of infections like a low-grade fever. Look for a patient who's had a, just had an MI and look for any underlying kidney disease. The other one that I want you guys to think about is usually radiation therapy. So if they have cancer and they've had some type of radiation therapy to the chest, that's another particular trigger because that's gonna injure the pericardium. The last one is usually someone who's had cardiac surgery. So a post-operative pericarditis. This is pretty common, especially if someone's having a cabbage, they're having open heart surgery for any reason. We also call this called post-pericardiotomy syndrome. So these are big things that'll cause inflammation all of these things right here, my friends, will lead to inflammation. And that'll cause this pericardium to become inflamed and angry. Now, whenever the pericardium becomes inflamed, generally it'll precipitate a chest pain. And I'd say that this is by far, for acute pericarditis, the hallmark feature. When this becomes super inflamed, it produces what's called a pleuritic chest pain. So it produces what's called a pleuritic chest pain. What does that mean? All right. Imagine you take a breath in. When you take a breath in, your lungs expand and press on what's next to the lungs? The heart. What surrounds the heart? The pericardium. So when you take a breath in and they expand, they push on the pericardium and it precipitates pain. The other thing is that this pleuritic chest pain is positional. So I want you to think about this. It's a pleuritic chest pain that is positional. What does this mean? All right. What this means is when you have a patient lay flat, what happens is their diaphragm pokes upwards into their actual thoracic cavity. 
and what's right there just above the diaphragm, the heart. And what surrounds the heart? The pericardium. So when patients are laying supine, it's worse. And when patients are actually leaning forward, what happens is it brings the diaphragm down and that puts less pressure and offloads the pericardium. So what I want you to understand with positional is it's worse supine and better leaning forward. This is pretty high yield and, and high yield and very, very common on patients who have pericarditis. All right, so that's high yield stuff there. Now, we know these are the triggers for a patient developing acute pericarditis. You know what else is a very interesting thing? When the pericardium becomes inflamed, sometimes what it'll do is it'll cause these like these cells, the visceral and parietal epithelial cells, to start secreting some fluid. And it can start secreting fluid and fluid and can accumulate in this pericardial cavity and get a little bit bigger. Normally we have a little bit, but if you start accumulating a lot, look what can start happening. Now fluid is really, really accumulating inside of this pericardial cavity. This is now, whenever it gets more than the upper limit of normal, it's called a pericardial effusion. So whenever there is an increase in serous fluid production, usually precipitated by what? Inflammation of the pericardium, this will stimulate a pericardial effusion. So acute pericarditis can lead to a pericardial effusion because you inflame the pericardium, causing it to make more serous fluid. What else can the acute pericarditis do? It can potentially progress. And let's say that you have a patient who has repeated, repeated inflammation. So I'm talking repeated bouts of inflammation. So we'll put repeated inflammation. What's out of the ones up there on the top for causes? What are those particular causes which if consistently keeps happening, can cause constricted pericarditis. Think about it. Would it be infectious? It could be if they have TB. TB is a definite one because it's a chronic disease. What about post MI? No. What about uremia? Not really. What about radiation therapy? 100%. Tuberculosis and radiation therapy happen to be the most common causes of repeated inflammation, which can then cause this angry pericardium to become fibrotic. So now, it's gonna be replaced with all this fibrous tissue. Look at this, I'm gonna put all this here in black. This is all gonna be fibrous tissue. And now imagine having this big rock hard fibrous tissue covering the heart. Now this dang heart can't expand. Now what happens is, normally the pericardium should let the heart kind of stretch a little bit. But whenever the pericardium is very, very fibrotic, so you're gonna have a fibrotic pericardium, the problem with this is that this actually is gonna be making it hard for the ventricles to fill. And what that does is that actually will lead to a reduction in ventricular filling. And that is one of the big pathophysiological processes that occur in constrictive pericarditis. You get a fibrotic pericardium, and this will then inhibit the ventricular filling process. Because look, it's making it hard. This, this heart has to stretch but it can't because this pericardium is super hard and fibrotic and not allowing it to stretch. So this process right here, my friends, is going to be inhibited. You can't allow that to occur. And that's the big concept that I want you to understand here. That's for constricted pericarditis. Okay, so so far we have a pericardium that's become inflamed. If it becomes inflamed, it can cause this classic chest pain. It also can cause serous fluid to accumulate, which can become a pericardial effusion. And if you repeatedly inflame the pericardium, it becomes fibrotic and reduces ventricular filling. Constricted pericarditis. We now know the differences between each one of these. But all of these are caused by the same thing. We come to another scenario. Let's say a patient has pericarditis. They develop a pericardial effusion. And the pericardial effusion continues to grow. So you develop a growing effusion. So this thing continues to grow nice and slow. And as this starts to happen and you grow this effusion, what happens is normally your pericardium gets time to stretch. And so if it's a very slow growing effusion, it has time to stretch and accommodate that. But whenever it grows enough that it gets to the point where the pericardial stretch limit has been reached, then what it does is it starts to squeeze on the heart 
and squeeze the heart and prevent it from being able to fill. Now look, it's squeezing it like constrictive pericarditis is. And so now this filling process, which is supposed to occur here, is being impaired. That's being inhibited. That's one very important concept. So whenever you have a pericardial effusion that's becoming tamponade, here's what I want you to remember. Let's say here we have this graph. Here we're gonna say this is the stretch limit. Whenever you reach this point and you go above it, the pressure inside of the pericardium is high, you squeeze the heart. We're gonna use this blue arrow here, where this person is accumulating volume slowly, 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 slowly. They finally hit the stretch limit and boom. They pass the stretch limit and now the pressure in the pericardium is high enough that it causes cardiac tamponade. So this is when you have a slow effusion. Let's take the worst case scenario, the one that makes your, your stank hole pucker a little bit. We take a patient and we decide that we're gonna push tons of blood into their pericardium. What's that called? That's called a hemopericardium. These are rapidly accumulating. The big one, most patients probably just die when they have this one, is you get what's called a free wall rupture. You guys likely remember this from the uh, coronary artery disease lecture, right? Whenever a patient develops a very large LED occlusion, they infarct this entire wall, it then ruptures, blood spills from the left ventricle right into the pericardium. That's terrifying. Another one is a proximal aortic dissection. So this is that Stanford A, right? So that proximal aortic dissection. If you have the root of the aorta and it just dissects right into that and boom, right into the pericardium, that can also be a big one. And then the classic ones, trauma, right? Or surgery. So you really wanna think about this in two particular scenarios. Did the patient just have an MI? Do they have any features of ripping, tearing chest pain that's classic of aortic dissection? Or did they have any trauma and surgical procedures? Usually these are the super, super obvious ones. What they do is, is they precipitate a hemopericardium to form. Hemopericardium. The scary thing about these, as I told you before, is that when this happens, they cause blood to form super quickly into the pericardial cavity. So now let's fill this pericardium with tons of blood. And usually in these particular scenarios, it, this doesn't occur slowly. This occurs extremely fast. So now, when it occurs very, very fast, what, look, look at this example here, right? Here's volume. It may only take 200 cc's as compared to like 500 cc's. It may only take a teensy bit, but it's gonna occur so quickly that it reaches the stretch limit, so quickly that the pericardium doesn't have time to compensate and stretch. So boom, guess what it does? Shoop, goes right into this high pressure area. Pericardial pressure rises. What does it then do? Squeezes on the heart and reduces it from being able to fill. This is an example of a rapid effusion. In this case, this is usually something like a hemopericardium is the most common cause. But in both of these scenarios, what are you noticing? That the pericardial pressure is going to be high. Once you've reached that stretch limit in both of these, the pericardial pressure is going to be high. And what is that going to do to the actual ventricular filling process? It's going to compress the heart. When it compresses the heart, so you're going to have right ventricle is the first one to be compressed, as well as the right atrium. The last one is usually the left atrium. These all get compressed. And whenever you compress them, are you gonna be able to fill them properly? No. And so this reduces the ventricular filling process massively. So in both of these scenarios, we'll just use this one as an example, there's an increase in the pericardial pressure due to hemopericardium or a serous fluid from a pericardial fusion. This then stimulates the compression of the right atrium, right ventricle, and massively decreases the ventricular filling process, like significantly. And this is what you see in cardiac tamponade. All right? Now, my friends, at this point, we have talked about pericardial diseases. We should have an understanding of it. Now let's talk about the complications, the scary things that you can potentially see with these pericardial diseases. When you have a patient who has a pericardial disease, you wanna figure out what's going on with these patients. So why are they complicated? What are some issues? What are some of the things that can arise? 
First thing, acute pericarditis. This one doesn't have any scary complications. Be thankful for that, right? It can potentially progress, and we'll talk about that. But oftentimes, the most particular classic findings that are usually seen in patients with acute pericarditis is pain. So whenever this pericardium becomes inflamed, usually what happens is these patients develop what's called a pleuritic chest pain. This is usually the most classic finding. Now, we'll represent CP as chest pain. The big thing about the pleuritic chest pain is that it's positional. So what do I mean? If a patient decides to lay supine, so whenever they're laying supine, what happens is, is it causes the diaphragm to kind of push up. And if the diaphragm pushes up, it pushes on the pericardium. And when it pushes on the pericardium, it precipitates pain. So supine will actually worse, worsen the chest pain, right? That's one thing. Whenever they're sitting, or they're leaning forward particularly, what it does is it brings the diaphragm down, offloads the pressure on the pericardium. So usually sitting or leaning forward will actually uh, improve the chest pain or decrease the chest pain. These are usually some very specific signs that I want you guys to remember. The other thing that can happen here, and this is also very important, is that not only when this pericardium becomes inflamed, it becomes angry and causes pain, but also when patients are getting auscultated, what happens is the layers rub up against one another during the actual cardiac cycle. And this produces this classic thing called a friction rub. So if a patient comes in, and here's what I want you guys to understand, because acute pericarditis is a clinical diagnosis. If a patient comes in with chest pain that occurs during breathing, it's positional, and they have an associated friction rub, it's almost completely diagnostic of pericarditis. Another thing that I want you guys to remember for pericarditis is the potential complications. So it does have the potential to progress. So let's say here you have an angry pericardium. What did I tell you could happen? It could start secreting some of that serous fluid. And the serous fluid could potentially accumulate, accumulate, accumulate in the actual pericardium. And if it does, what is this called? An effusion. So one of the other potential findings that you can see here is these patients can get pericardial effusions. That's another classic finding that you would see in a patient who has pericarditis. They get a pleuritic chest pain, a friction rub, and an effusion on echocardiogram. Yes, this effusion could potentially progress. If it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it can become tamponade, which we will talk about. And we talked about a little bit prior. The other thing that we said is with repeated bouts of inflammation, what can happen? This tissue can become super fibrotic. And when it becomes super fibrotic, it actually reduces ventricular filling and this can lead to constrictive pericarditis. So the big things that I want you to remember from acute pericarditis is the classic findings and the potential to progress to an effusion, sometimes to cardiac tamponade, and also with repeated bouts of inflammation can progress to constrictive pericarditis. All right, let's talk about the next thing. Constrictive pericarditis. We know that this can be uh, formed by a patient having acute pericarditis that has repeated bouts of inflammation. You guys remember the triggers? Radiation therapy, TB, those are usually the biggest things. Sometimes malignancy as well, but we won't go too far in that. The classic finding is that this pericardium is so rigid, it's so fibrotic that what it does is it compresses the weaker ventricle. Which one would you say is a little bit weaker, not as much of a thicker muscle layer? The right ventricle. And so what it does is it compresses or it releases, reduces the filling of the right heart. Now, if you compress this, imagine blood trying to come in from the right atrium into the right ventricle. It's gonna be inhibited. And if this is inhibited, what's it gonna do? It's gonna start backing up into the supervena cava, into the actual jugular veins, or backs up into the inferior vena cava and down into some of the actual structures there in the abdomen or in the lower extremities. And what happens here is this is usually, we use a particular terminology called central venous pressure. This is usually elevated. And because it's elevated, what it does is, if it's in the superior vena cave, it extends all the way up to the jugular veins and plumps those puppies up. And it leads to something called JVD. Super classic sign here. Another thing that I really want you guys to remember though, is patients that have constrictive pericarditis. Sometimes this JVD is super intense. And you can even see potentially a variant of it. And what we call this is we call this a small sign. So it's basically like JVD, but it's in a weird particular scenario. And let me explain what I mean here. So this JVD can potentially also present as Kuzmol sign. So this 
right heart is being compressed. It's having a hard time filling. When you take a deep breath in, normally your intrathoracic pressure drops and you suck blood into the right heart. But if you're, being comp if you're compressing that right heart, it's not gonna fill. So during inspiration, their JVD stays distended. And that's paradoxical. So they can have a paradoxical distension of their jugular vein during inspiration. Classic Kuzmol sign. What else did you see that in? Do you guys remember? Restrictive cardiomyopathy can also have this. The other thing here is, this central venous pressure can also extend to the liver and cause hepatomegaly, right? So it can cause hepatic congestion. And if you cause hepatic congestion, we said that this makes it harder for blood to be able to get out of the liver, right? This will cause injury here, and this can progress to potentially liver failure, like cirrhosis. All right? The other concept here is that it can even extend to the lower extremity veins. When it extends to the lower extremity veins, this can even cause edema. So sometimes these patients can experience what's called pitting edema. So you push on their lower extremity, you leave like a big old indent in it. Super classic here as well. The last thing is, it can also increase your portal pressures. So it can cause patients to develop portal hypertension. And this portal hypertension can cause fluid to accumulate within the abdomen because the pressures of the peritoneal capillaries become increased and they develop something called ascites. So these are all, and at this point you guys should understand, and it'll become so like second nature at this point, the features of left heart failure and right heart failure. This is classic features of right heart failure. So the question then arises, how do I know if this is different then between other types of causes of right heart failure or different between restrictive cardiomyopathy? Because that's how they love to try to trick you on the exam. They both have Kussmaul sign, they both have right heart failure. You know what else? Constricted pericarditis is interesting. This pericardium is so rock solid that whenever the ventricles try to actually distend, it bumps up against that rock solid pericardium and makes like a knocking sound. And this is classic. It's called a pericardial knock. And that's one way that you can try to differentiate these based on the clinical findings here that are suggestive of constricted pericarditis. In other words, you'd have to go down the routes of echocardiogram to really determine that difference or other modalities, which we'll talk about. All right, this is constricted pericarditis. We come to the Mac Daddy of them all. This is cardiac tamponade. So cardiac tamponade is the scary one. We said that this can be formed because of a hemopericardium, so a proximal aortic dissection will be a one, left ventricular wall rupture where it just explodes, trauma, cardiac surgery, something to that effect, or a progressively enlarging pericardial effusion due to pericarditis, viral infections, post-MI, uremia, things to that effect. When these patients develop these accumulations, we're just going to say here in this particular scenario, this could be blood, this could be fluid, it doesn't really matter in this example. All we know is that the pericardium has this collection. And remember I told you, this is kind of the confounding factor and it brings about cognitive dissonance. We think that the amount of fluid in the pericardium is the problem. That's not the case. You can have a little bit of fluid in the pericardium, but it accumulated rapidly and compressed the heart during diastole. Or you could have a ton of fluid that has accumulated over time, it's reached the stretch limit of the pericardium and compresses the right heart. It doesn't matter about the volume, it matters about if it's able to compress the actual right heart. So, in this scenario, what do we see? We see right heart compression, particularly it compresses the right atrium, and then it compresses the right ventricle, and then if it gets really, really high, it can compress the left atrium as well. But the whole concept here is that it makes it impossible for blood to come down here into the right ventricle, right? So what you're gonna do is, is this is actually going to cause a reduction in right ventricular filling, all right? Then if you reduce the right ventricular filling, another thing that also happens here is that your right ventricular pressure is gonna rise so much that it's also going to shift <laughs> the septum. And now look, the septum gets shifted from the right ventricle towards the left ventricle. Look how tiny that space is now in the left ventricle. Now what you're going to do is, is you're going to impair filling into the left ventricle. So there's a reduction in right ventricular filling and there is a septal shift from the which side? From the right ventricle to the left ventricle. Both of these things will then massively reduce left ventricular filling. If you reduce the left ventricular filling, you're gonna reduce the stroke volume and then reduce the cardiac output. 
So these patients will have a very low cardiac output and then that precipitates a low blood pressure. So what you're gonna see out of these patients is that they are going to have a very, very low blood pressure. So we call this hypotension, right? Sometimes this hypotension can be low enough that you don't perfuse organs and that is called shock. So that's what we can see is we can see potentially very low blood pressure that could progress to shock. What are ways that your body tries to compensate for a low cardiac output? It constricts the vessels, so it tries to increase your SVR, but it may try to increase your heart rate. So one of the other reflexive reactions here is this may try to create a reflex reaction. And one of the reflex reactions here is to increase the patient's heart rate. So they will have low blood pressure, they'll have tachycardia. You know what else? If blood can't get into the right side of the heart, where does it go? I already told you this. It'll back up into the jugular veins because what's increased? Your central venous pressure. If central venous pressure is increased, what is that gonna do to your jugular veins then? It's gonna plump those suckers up. And so what we will see is, is we see a increase in the jugular venous pressure or jugular venous extension. So if I see jugular venous extension, I see shock, features of hypotension and tachycardia, and one other finding, which is super common. Look how much fluid could be around this. If you have a big, big, big effusion there, it may be hard to listen and auscultate and hear heart sounds. So one of the other findings is muffled heart sounds. And if I have a patient who has these three particular findings, which is what? We're gonna mark these here. One, JVD. Two, muffled heart sounds. Three, features of shock, such as hypotension. This is classic of cardiac tamponade. And you know what they call this, these three findings? It's called a triad. We call these Beck's triad. Now in true <laughs> like reality, this is probably not as common, but for your boards, super high yield. <clears throat> okay, that's one finding. The next thing that also will seal the diagnosis of cardiac tamponade and help you is if you see this feature of pulses paradoxus. You can see this in other disorders, but this is gonna be classic in cardiac tamponade. What happens here is, let's say here we have a normal heart, and then we have a heart that gets progressed to tamponade. So here, we're gonna say that they have the progression into tamponade. So tamponade has developed in this normal heart. So now they have fluid all up in their pericardium, whether this is serous fluid, whether this is blood, it doesn't really matter, the concept is the same. The concept is, is that this fluid is compressing the right heart and impairing the filling process, right? That is being inhibited. Now, if we look at this concept, when a patient decides to breathe, you have respirophasic changes in their blood pressure. So here's an arterial line. So you have a patient who has an arterial line in it and you're monitoring their blood pressure. Here in a normal patient, whenever they expire, so this is an expiration, this is an inspiration, and this is another expiration. What do you notice? You notice a small little decrease in their systolic blood pressure during inspiration, a tiny little change it should generally be less than 10 millimeter mercury decrease in systolic blood pressure during, I'm gonna abbreviate this, inspiration. That's normal, okay? So this would be a normal scenario. In tamponade, however, what do you notice? Well, they're compressing their right heart, right? So whenever they try to take a deep breath in, what happens? They're trying to suck blood into the right heart, but they have a reduced filling. And on top of that, not only do they have reduced right ventricular filling, but what did I say happens to the septum? It shifts. So now you shift their septum and reduce left ventricular filling. <laughs> so they're supposed to be getting blood into their heart during inspiration, but are they getting blood into their heart during inspiration? No, not enough. And so whenever they go through systole and try to push blood out, they don't push out enough. So their systolic blood pressure drops. So in this scenario, you see expiration, you see inspiration, and again, you see expiration. What do you notice the differences between here? Huge drop in the systolic blood pressure during inspiration because of a reduction in RV filling and septal shifting, reducing the left ventricular filling and cardiac output. 
So this has to be greater than a 10 millimeter mercury drop in the systolic blood pressure during inspiration. And this is classic of tamponade. All right, so with that being said, we now have an understanding here of all the different types of pericardial diseases and how they could potentially present and progress. Now what I wanna do is I wanna take some time and go through the diagnostic approach. All right, how do we approach pericardial diseases given these findings? Well, first thing is acute pericarditis, you need at least two or more out of the four findings to make this diagnosis. One, pleuritic chest pain. Two, a friction rub. Three, classic EKG changes. The classic EKG changes is usually there's diffuse ST segment elevation that's present and usually it's in this kind of like concave or smiley face type of appearance. That's one thing. Sometimes you can see these like little hooks there as well that also can be potentially suggestive of more of a pericarditis picture. But again, diffuse ST segment elevations. And here's the classic thing, PR segment depression. If you see that the PR segments are depressed below the isoelectric line, that's classic, especially if combined with ST elevations, pleuritic chest pain and friction rub, classically seen with acute pericarditis. So there's three out of the four. What's the fourth finding? It's an echo. And if the echocardiogram shows a pericardial effusion, you have clinched the diagnosis of acute pericarditis. All you need is at least two or more out of the four findings. Again, pleuritic chest pain, friction rub, classic EKG changes, and a pericardial effusion, and you've made the diagnosis. Constricted pericarditis, again, look for right heart failure, Kussmaul sign, and a pericardial knock. ECG, sometimes because the actual pericardium is so thick, it alters the um, electrical waves that are moving from the heart to the pericardium, to the chest, to the electrode. And so the voltages can be low, but that's not super helpful. What would be helpful if you get an echo and you see a thick pericardium there, you see that septum bouncing from the right side to the left side. That's also classic of constricted pericarditis. And then abrupt drops in ventricular filling during inspiration. That's usually the classic signs of constricted pericarditis. Sometimes though, you may need a cardiac CT or MRI to really clinch the diagnosis to show that very, very thickened pericardium. And then sometimes catheterization may also be helpful here. We'll talk about how that's really important, especially with differentiating between restrictive cardiomyopathy. The next one is pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusions, if you have a lot of fluid that's present within the pericardium and it's causing the actual apex to move in the fluid from kind of like left to right during the cardiac cycle, then it'll cause alterations in the amplitude of the QRS complex. Because imagine the heart, the electrode is like right here. And then all of a sudden when the heart is moving in this fluid, the apex where usually you're having that constant vector down uh, lead two going towards like the apex, that's moving off of that, that kind of like axis. And so because of that, that'll cause alterations in the QRS complexes. And again, if you see that, that's one thing. You see a pericardial effusion, which is this fluid here within the pericardial cavity, that could also be helpful in making the diagnosis of pericardial effusion. The last one is cardiac tamponade. Again, you're gonna see the same concept. You need a pericardial effusion, and you're gonna see that electrical alternance, maybe low QRS voltages, but the echo is super classic. It's a pericardial effusion for one, but you need the next thing to make the diagnosis. You need a chamber collapse. So here's the right atrium, here's the right ventricle. You need these to collapse during diastole. That is the key feature. All right, so we've made the kind of like diagnostic approaches done for cardiac tamponade, for constrictive pericarditis, acute pericarditis, and pericardial effusion. Really quickly with constrictive pericarditis, because they love to test you for this on the exam, is how do we differentiate these two? On physical exam, they're both gonna have features of right heart failure, but they'll also have Kussmaul sign. One of the big differences though is constrictive pericarditis is a pericardial knock. Restrictive cardiomyopathy does not. Echocardiogram, you'll have a thick pericardium. You'll have a septal bounce. You'll have an abrupt drop in ventricular filling. Restrictive, you're gonna have biatrial enlargement and diastolic dysfunction. For the cardiac CT or MRI, you'll see a thick pericardium. For restrictive cardiac cardiomyopathy, it's a normal pericardium. And then a cardiac cath, what happens is in constrictive pericarditis, the septum, intraventricular septum is healthy. So it'll bounce from left to right, left to right, which will cause discordance of the ventricular pressures, the in diastolic pressures in the left and right ventricle. 
Whereas restrictive cardiomyopathy, the septum is stiff, rigid, it's filled with infiltrates, and it will not move. And therefore, there will not be this discordance of end diastolic pressures that occur. All right. How do we treat pericardial diseases? Well, first thing is, if it's acute, it's all about the pain. Really, that's the big thing that you're trying to treat. But treat the underlying cause. So one of the big things is most common cause of acute pericarditis is viral, so Coxsackie B virus. So NSAIDs will help to reduce the inflammation there, and colchicine will help to, again, help to have a little bit of a prevention as well. Aspirin and colchicine would be the best if the cause is due to post-MI. And here's the biggest thing, and they can really trip you up with this on the exam. Uremia, it's not doing any of these. It's dialyzing these patients, whether it's starting them on dialysis or giving them more frequent dialysis sessions. That is super helpful. And again, treating acute pericarditis. Because if it's uremia, these above measures won't help you. It's dialyzing them because the uremia is causing these complications. Constrictive pericarditis, again, with this one, it's usually a pericardiectomy. So the pericardium is so fibrotic, rigid, there's nothing that you can really do. You can try to treat the underlying causes from preventing the, the progression, but you got to cut out that disease pericardium. Pericardial effusion, you don't really do anything. It's just observation. Maybe get a, a serial kind of transthoracic ultras, uh, echocardiogram in a couple months. And then again, if it's continuing to get bigger or you figured out the underlying cause, again, then you can try and treat those. But if it does not improve, sometimes you can do a pericardial window. I would say this is for recurrent fusions that are usually neoplastic in origin. So there's some type of neoplasia that's usually causing this. And the design to use the pericardial window is so that the pericardial fluid doesn't collect, 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 and cause the patient to go into cardiac tamponade. But if the patient does develop tamponade, what is the treatment? It's always stabilizing the hemodynamics because this can cause the patient to go into obstructive shock. So give them IV fluids, start them on vasopressors if need be. But the best thing that you can do for these patients is if it is, again, if it, even if it is, it says here non-hemopericardium, even if it is a hemopericardium, regardless, you want to try to do a pericardiosynthesis, pull the fluid off. Because what you're going to do is you're going to help to make the diagnosis because if the blood pressure improves and they come out of the shock state, again, you've made the diagnosis, oh, it's cardiac tamponade. Plus, on top of that, you've treated them therapeutically. Um, if the patient does have a hemopericardium, you can still do a pericardiosynthesis, but it's not going to be enough because it'll likely reaccumulate. And that's where this next step comes in. If it is a hemopericardium, you can do a pericardiosynthesis first, but you're probably going to have to go in and actually fix the underlying issue. Did the aortic dissection cause this? Did a free wall rupture cause this? Did they develop trauma to the chest that caused this? I got to go fix those things so it doesn't actually reaccumulate. All right, my friends, that covers pericardial diseases. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.